Good morning and welcome to West Fork Baptist Church Online. We often have people joining us from Toronto, Virginia, Minnesota, and wherever you are watching from, we welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus and trust that our time together uh, this morning will be a blessing to you. Thanks to Nick and Dana and their family for leading us in worship in song. I trust that all things are going well for you and your family during these days. I want to remind you of a few things. Uh, first of all, a couple of opportunities this week for group meetings using Zoom. So we get together uh, through the Zoom platform and we meet together Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock for an informal time of sharing and prayer, and then Wednesday afternoon at 2 for a Bible study in Ephesians. The other thing I want to remind you of is that daily bread booklets that begin in June are available at our house. So swing by our home, 102 Glendale Crescent. Just reach in the mailbox. You don't need to knock on the door or ask or anything. Uh, just help yourself and uh, then you'll be ready if you uh, use that in your devotional time with the Lord. Um, I heard a neat story this morning, just on the way to church to record this message, a little bit after seven on uh, Sunday morning. They were playing a story about a lady, I think her name's Vera Kupel, who served in the Navy in World War II and had a gift for music and had a longing all her life uh, to publish a song that would be played on the radio. She's 95 years old. She lives in Nova Scotia, and she lives in a care home for people with dementia and Alzheimer's. And one of the kind staff members there uh, arranged for somebody to come in and record this song. It's about Canada, and um, it's just a wonderful little song that she sang. And, uh, and so they recorded it, and then CBC played it over the radio, and she was listening to her song and um, just tears running down her face. And uh, what she said at the end, somebody said, do you have any advice uh, for someone in light of the fact that your song uh, is now published and is being listened to? And she said, yeah, my advice is never give up and never lose hope. Well, we're talking a lot about hope in this series. Uh, so I've entitled this series, Hope in a World That's Not Our Home, as we go through a study of uh, First Peter. And um, so we're all going through a time of suffering uh, to one extent or another. What is helping you to get through your suffering? Is it financial aid from the government? Is it our uh, leaders, municipal leaders and uh, federal leaders giving positive statements like, we'll get through this, we're all in this together. Well, you know what? We can do a lot better than that. And we are going to have our hearts filled this morning, I think, as we look into 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. So I'm going to read that scripture for us, and then we'll have a word of prayer. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes, even though refined by fire, may, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is God's word. Let's bow for prayer. 
Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to you for all the blessings that you pour into our lives. Some of those we expressed in song earlier as we sang about finding our rest in you alone, our rock and our salvation, a fortress strong against our foes, and we will not be shaken. What a blessing it is to know, Lord, that in this world, you are the one who is keeping us. You are watching over us. Your name is a strong tower, Proverbs says. The righteous run into it and are safe. And so we do feel safe, Lord, in our relationship with you. And Father, what a joy it was to sing. What a gift of grace is Jesus, our Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is our joy, our righteousness and freedom, our steadfast love, and our deep and boundless peace. So we find so much uh, when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. All these things are found in him alone, and our cup really does overflow with one blessing after another. And then, Father, we thank you that as we journey through life and as we near the end of our journey, that on that day when our strength is failing, the end draws near and our time has come, still our souls will sing your praise unending 10,000 years and then forevermore. What a great God you are. We worship and adore you this morning. We give you the adoration of our hearts. Father, we pray that you would be with those who are struggling. We think of brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who are suffering for their faith in the Lord Jesus. We pray for those connected with our church family who have lost loved ones and are undergoing trials of various kinds. Uh, some are facing surgery, some are recovering from surgery, some are just dealing, Lord, with the weariness of uh, chronic physical ailments. And so we just pray for your grace and strength for each one. We pray for those who are facing financial pressures and family problems, Lord, that you would grant wisdom and grace. And now, Lord, we ask that you would, uh, as we draw near to you, that you would draw near to us by your Holy Spirit and help us as we look into your word to understand and apply it to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. First and Second Peter are letters written to suffering Christians. When the original readers became believers in Jesus Christ, it put them at odds with the societies in which they lived. And in many parts of the world, that can lead to outright persecution and even death. Listen to this report. So I'm getting this from the app that's available for open doors that gives us information and prayer requests for Christians around the world who are suffering. So they write, friends, uh, we've heard reports that Christians in India are experiencing even more persecution during the coronavirus lockdown. Before the lockdown, they were often ostracized, forcing many of them to have to travel to outside villages to work for their daily wages. Now they suffer even more as they are trapped in their villages where they are opposed by everyone. At the same time, many Christians are left out of the government's relief distribution process. Imagine that, just by, because you're a Christian, you don't get the support that's available to everybody else. Violent attacks on believers are still rampant in many areas, but now it is even more difficult for Christians to escape their attackers. For example, a group of Christians recently tried to resettle in another area after they were chased out of their homes. However, as they were constructing their new homes, the Christians were attacked and badly beaten and their homes were completely destroyed. 
So we need to remember our brothers and sisters in Christ in India and other places where it is very dangerous for a person to come to faith in Jesus Christ because of the opposition from the communities in which they live. In our society, the suffering is less dangerous, but it is just as real and it's growing in intensity. Um, so uh, some Christians in our culture, they will lose friends because they don't participate with them anymore in uh, the things that they used to do because they're sinful. I've heard of other Christians who have been passed over for job promotions uh, because of their commitment to live a Christian life. And then we had the recent example of uh, Samaritan's Purse, a Christian relief organization that erected a field hospital in Central Park in New York. And then when people got wind of this committed Christian organization that uh, stands on the scriptures, they were slammed by politicians and uh, by uh, writers of articles and there were even protests with people holding up signs against um, these Christians who had set up a hospital to care for coronavirus patients all because uh, their beliefs coming from the Bible about human sexuality didn't match with the militant LGBTQ agenda uh, that permeates our society today. So when we look at this section, uh, verses 3 to 12, we're only going to verse 9, but this whole section through to verse 12 is one long sentence in Greek. We, you would never be able to get away with this uh, writing an essay in uh, high school. Uh, it would come back and they would tell you to, to change your grammar there because you, you can't write a long sentence like that. But in Greek, you could do that, and it worked for them. Peter is directing his reader's attention away from their trials toward the hope that they have in God. And the main part of this passage is praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the rest of that long sentence there explains why we should praise God. So let's look into that this morning. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word praise there, in Greek, it's eulogetos, and it means to speak a good word about. So when you go to a funeral sometimes, somebody will be designated to give a eulogy. What they're actually doing there is speaking a good word about the person who has passed away. When you think about it, no one deserves eulogizing more than God because of who he is, what he has done, and what he is doing. Everywhere we turn in the Bible, we are commanded to praise and worship God. And you know what? That bothers a lot of people. It bothered Brad Pitt. I came across a report uh, in an interview that Brad Pitt did saying that he was raised in a Christian home, but he, he turned away from it. He said, I didn't understand this idea of a God who says you have to acknowledge me. You have to say that I'm the best and then I'll give you eternal happiness. If you don't, then you don't get it. It seemed to be about ego. I can't see God operating from ego, so it made no sense to me, end of quote. So Brad Pitt, this was a big turnoff for him. The late C.S. Lewis also used to think that way, but when he became a Christian and thought about it a little bit more, uh, his thinking about praising God changed. And uh, he writes in a little book, I've got an old uh, yellow paperback copy of C.S. Lewis's Reflection on the Psalms. And in there, uh, he writes that the most obvious fact about when we praise something, whether God or anything, he says, the most obvious fact about that strangely escaped me. I thought of it in terms of compliment, approval, or the giving of honor. I had never noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise. The world rings with praise. Readers praise their favorite poet. Walkers praise the countryside. 
players praise their favorite game. Praise of weather, wine, dishes, actors, motors, horses, colleges, countries, historical personages, children, flowers, mountains, rare stamps, rare beetles, even sometimes politicians or scholars. And uh, so, and he writes, I had not noticed either that just as men spontaneously praise what they value, so they spontaneously urge us to join them in praising it by saying, isn't she lovely? Wasn't that glorious? Don't you think that magnificent? The Bible writers in telling everyone to praise God are doing what all men do when they speak of what they care about. So uh, you, can, you can dig a little deeper into that. Uh, C.S. Lewis is thinking on why we need to praise the Lord. And that's what Peter is exhorting us to do. He's directing his readers' attention and our attention away from our trials to God. And he starts by exhorting us to praise him. We are commanded to praise God because all things exist by him and for him. He is the reason that everything is. We read uh, about that in Romans chapter 11 and verse 36. For from him, from God, through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Failed, failure to worship and praise God is to miss the meaning and purpose of our very lives. The uh, people who wrote the Westminster Catechism said that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's the main purpose why we exist, to delight in God, to enjoy a relationship with him, to have it flood our lives and capture our hearts to the extent that praise freely flows from our lips. Even Jesus, in defining eternal life, said this in John chapter 17 and verse 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So Christianity is a relationship with the living God. And in that relationship, we discover how wonderful, how gracious, how merciful God is. And his praise then should be continually found on our lips. In this section, Peter mentions a number of things that God in his great mercy has given us. And much of what he mentions here is framed in Old Covenant language that is applied to believers in the New Covenant established by Jesus Christ. So when you consider this and you think about all the things that the nation of Israel had in the Old Covenant that was established by God, Peter is reaching back and he's grabbing some of that language and he's saying these concepts now apply to you who are believers in Jesus Christ in the new covenant that was uh, established through Jesus' atoning death and his resurrection from the dead. So the first thing that we come across as Peter starts to go down the blessings and the benefits that we have that should cause us to praise the Lord, he begins with this idea of a new birth. Now this gift, this blessing, echoes Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Nicodemus, if you recall, was a teacher. Uh, he was a scribe who taught others the word of God. He came to Jesus at night. And uh, he was wondering about uh, the assurance of a relationship with God. And Jesus said to him, unless a man is born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. So Peter is, is grabbing that concept and he says, think about the blessing it is to have a new birth through faith in Jesus Christ. This new birth defines our identity in God's family. So in that sense, we are partakers. Peter gets to this later on in 2 Peter chapter 3, I believe, where he talks about us being partakers of the divine nature. We all need God to breathe, breathe life into our sin-dead souls. So this is the first thing that comes to us that causes our hearts to praise God and it comes on the basis of God's mercy to us 
in Christ. Secondly, uh, Peter talks about a living, functional hope. Biblical hope is more than a vague wish. It is a certain expectation of the future. Peter calls this a living hope. He uses the same word as the author of Hebrews uses in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 where he writes that the word of God is living and active. And, and the point there is that the word of God, when we pick it up, this is a lively word. This is a living word. It is active. It is functional. It can pierce through um, the, the barriers that are there in our lives and bring us to life in Christ. That is what Peter is saying, that hope, the living hope that we have, that we are born into through faith in Jesus is that it can function that same way. It is a living hope because it comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Think of how the resurrection completely transformed Peter, who's writing this letter. After the crucifixion, Peter was in absolute despair because of his denial. But when Jesus rose from the dead, uh, Peter was restored and was commissioned to serve. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is life-changing truth. It's, it's the thing uh, that causes us to become alive when we put our faith and trust in Christ. Jesus' resurrection provides hope in the following ways. It assures that our debt has been paid. The gospel is incomplete without the resurrection. We would still be in our sins, as Paul says, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 17, if Jesus is not risen from the dead. So yes, he paid for our sins. His resurrection is proof that payment was accepted and we are free from the penalty of sin. The other way that it gives us, gives us hope is it means that death doesn't have the last word. Even if we are persecuted to death, we know that we will follow our Savior through death and into life. Thirdly, uh, we've got seven blessings in this list. So thirdly, we have a preserved inheritance. As Peter writes, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you. An inheritance is a gift that's based on a relationship. It's not based on us earning or working for anything. It's based on the relationship that we have with God. Uh, F.W. Beer put it this way, that our inheritance is untouched by death, unstained by evil, unimpaired by time. The fourth blessing is a shielded journey. Here Peter writes, you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Now salvation is a present possession. The moment that you trust in Jesus Christ, you are saved. But there's more to come. The complete exclusion of sin, the glorification of our bodies, face-to-face -face fellowship with the triune God, a family reunion including every tribe and tongue and people and language, and the list goes on and on. There's more of that full salvation that is coming our way. And... Um, in the meantime, we are on this pilgrimage to receive that full salvation. And, and while we are doing that, we are shielded by God's power. So if you combine this with what Peter said about our uh, protected inheritance, he is saying that God keeps our inheritance for us and he keeps us for our inheritance. So he's doing both things there. He, He's keeping our inheritance. He's guarding us as we are making our pilgrimage through uh, the world in which we live. We have so many promises in the scriptures about uh, God's protective care of his people. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8. God will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you wonder sometimes if you were going to make it to the end? Uh, Maybe you've had a rough week and you think, boy, did I ever blow it this past week. My faith was so weak and feeble 
I don't even know if I'm going to make it through to the end. God is guarding and protecting us as we live our lives here. And here is a verse that says that he will keep us strong to the end. Psalm 34, verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Psalm 37, verses 23 and 24, if the Lord delights in a man's way, he makes his steps firm. Though he stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. And my last one, and I could just fill sl slide after slide with promises of the Lord's keeping and protection of his people. Isaiah 54, verse 17, no weapon forged against you will prevail. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. We greatly rejoice in God's protection, though now for a little while we may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Suffering here, uh, Peter is saying, is brief from the perspective of eternity. It's only for a little while. But it sure does feel like it's going to last forever when we're in the midst of that. So you who are, are, are just struggling under a continued burden, whatever that burden is, know that uh, it is just a little while compared to the blessings and the joy that we will experience when we are in God's presence. On to number five. Uh, the fifth blessing is a refined faith found in verse seven. These trials that we have to experience for a little while have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. The trials that we go through have the same effect on our faith as fire has on gold. So uh, they mine the ore, they get the ore, they, they put it in a crucible, they blast it with uh, high temperatures and the ore melts. And what happens then is the impurities that are found in those rocks come to the surface and the refiner is able to scoop those away. And then as the metal cools, it hardens and there is pure gold or, or pure whatever it is uh, that they've been refining. And um, so there it is in its purity. And Peter is saying that the trials that we go through in this life have the same effect on our faith, that there is a purifying, there is a refining that is going on to our faith in God. Uh, Alan Stibbs put it this way, God uses trials to distinguish genuine faith from superficial profession. So that's the thing that we find. We find that in many places in the Bible. One that comes to mind is the parable of the soils and uh, the soil where the weeds, where the seed is sown among the weeds, the weeds grow up and they choke out the fruitfulness there of uh, the, the uh, seed that is growing because of the cares of this world. And um, materialism and other things come in that show that our hearts really haven't been given over to the Lord. So trials test our faith. They distinguish genuine faith from superficial profession. The glory and honor and praise that Peter talks about here in this verse, it may be directed to God because he is ultimately the one who causes us to persevere to the end. But it isn't uh, contradictory to think that it could apply to faithful believers on the last day. We have examples of that. In Matthew 25 and verse 23, the master says to the servant, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And also 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in the darkness. 
He will expose the motive of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. The sixth blessing is an inexpressible and glorious joy. Uh, Peter writes in verse 8, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. We know, what, uh, we know something of what inexpressible and glorious joy is. Uh, I think the, the uh, best illustration I can think of is when, uh, when we had kids born into our family. And uh, so you're holding that little newborn and, and you, can't, you can't even explain the feeling that that is to have this little human being uh, in your possession. And, you know, somebody, said, somebody might ask you a question, well, how do you feel? And you can't even express it. And if that's how we feel over newborn babies or other things that, that just give you uh, that overflowing joy, then how much more? is that joy inexpressible and glorious when we consider the things that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Peter had the privilege of seeing and touching and hearing Jesus during his ministry, but you and I are in the same boat as Peter's original readers. We have not seen Jesus, but we love him and believe in him just the same. Remember Thomas? who refused to believe the testimony of his trusted friends after Jesus rose from the dead. And Thomas uh, wasn't in the gathering when Jesus appeared to the disciples. And he said, I will not believe unless I am able to put my hands into the wounds in his hands and his side. And then uh, Jesus came and uh, he appeared while Thomas was there. When Jesus did appear, he spoke a blessing for all who would believe in him through the testimony of the apostles. He says in uh, John 20 and verse 29, Jesus told Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So um, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ through the testimony that we find in the word of God. Uh, Through faith, we come into our own firsthand experience, a living experience, a living relationship with a living Lord Jesus Christ. Our relationship is not with a book. We don't worship the Bible, but through the scriptures, the living and active word of God, we come to know who Jesus Christ is and we enter into a relationship with the triune God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And uh, we, we take that into every area of our lives. So we do not worship a book, but a Savior whom we have come to know through the scriptures and the work of the Holy Spirit. What is this inexpressible and glorious joy that fills us? It is inexpressible because we don't have the capacity as human beings to express it fully or perfectly enough, what it means to be rescued from the condemnation of our sin and be given the free gift of eternal life and forgiveness of our sins. Lastly, Peter talks about a ripening salvation. That's my term, ripening, and I'll explain that in a minute. We find that in verse nine. For you are receiving the goal of your faith the salvation of your souls. Now, this is the second time in this section that we come across this idea that that salvation is progressive. It's already complete. It's a gift that's fully, fully paid for and provided through the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus came. When he died on the cross, he took the penalty of our sin and suffered the punishment that was due to us. And so he bore our sins in his own body on the cross and he rose from the, from the grave. So our salvation, our rescue from God's wrath 
and the condemnation of our sin is fully paid for and complete because it's provided by the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm using this word ripening that, that to talk about the process of receiving this salvation. Salvation applies to the whole person. When Peter uses the word souls here, it stands for whole persons, including our bodies, that, that salvation, God's salvation extends to every aspect of our being. We are saved the moment that we trust in Christ. We will receive salvation in all its fullness when Jesus Christ appears. But at the present time, we are receiving more and more of the blessings of salvation as we grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why I use this idea of a ripening uh, salvation, that as we walk with the Lord in this pilgrimage of life, salvation becomes sweeter and sweeter to us as we come to understand it and apply it to our lives. This passage that we've looked at this morning prods us to refresh our hearts in all that God has given us by his great mercy. Are you struggling right now with trials and suffering? We live in an age of entitlement and demanding our rights, but we need instead to focus on the great mercy that God has demonstrated in granting so many blessings that will not spoil our faith. Are those blessings yours? Have you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross to pay the penalty of sin and rose again from the dead that we might have the assurance of our salvation? If that's not your present experience, but you're curious and you want to know more, Please call the church, leave a message on the answering machine. We'll get back to you, 623-0021, or write me an email, al at westfortbaptist.org. We'd be glad to talk with you about how these blessings that come from God's mercy can be your possession that just changes our whole perspective on trials and hardships and the suffering that we experience in this life. So just to refresh our memories, uh, these are the things that come to us from God's great mercy. A new birth, a living functional hope, a preserved inheritance, a shielded journey, a refined faith, an inexpressible and glorious joy, and a ripening salvation as we walk with the Lord. It becomes sweeter and sweeter as time goes on. As we dwell on these things, we will indeed praise God from whom all blessings flow. Let me uh, send us away with this benediction from Romans chapter 15 and verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. God bless, and we'll see you the next time, Lord willing.